I just want to mention, we were mentioning uh, the idea of tzedakah helping aniyim. And I just want to digress a little bit just to answer a question that comes up a lot. Uh, there is uh, an Aveira in the Torah called you're not allowed to test Hashem, right? You're not allowed to say to Hashem, I'll do a mitzvah if you give me a certain reward. And if you don't give me the reward, that means the mitzvah is wrong. If one has the attitude that I can put HaKadosh Baruch Hu to a test uh, that is sinful, uh, the Torah says, do not test God. Do not give God tests. You can ask Hashem, in the merit of my mitzvah, help me, but you can't, as it were, kind of put God to a definitive test. But the Gemara in Tainus says that there is seemingly one exception to that rule, and that is the giving of miser, the giving of a tithe to the poor, where it's mutter to test Hashem because there's an absolute promise, seemingly, that you will get ashiris, you will get wealth, if you give maisha. Uh, and that's a pasuk in Malachi, b'chanuni navizais. Hashem says, give me a test. B'chanuni, give me a b'china. Im loyeftach lachem esarubas hashemayim, that you will see that I will open up the windows of heaven, rain and everything else, I will give you a bracha without limit. And the Shulchan Aruch so paskins that it's mutter l'nasais ha-kadosh baracha. This is considered to be a guarantee. That's the pashtas. So the immediate question is, uh, guys are always interested in uh, these uh, get-rich-quick schemes. And this is, is this a legitimate get-rich-quick scheme? Is it legitimate for me to basically say, I'm going to give my miser, I'm going to give staka, and God will make me rich? Uh, and la maisa, it doesn't seem to work in that way. Uh, people give miser, they don't become Bill Gates or, or whatever, whatever it is. So the question is, is it a test or is it a uh, guaranteed thing? Is it not a guaranteed thing? If it's not a guaranteed thing, why not? Uh, doesn't the Gemara say? It's supposed to be a guaranteed thing. So I just want to give you a few different reasons. Bottom line is, it's not a guaranteed thing. Meaning, meaning if the pshat is, I give Meister and I'm going to become rich, the short answer is, maybe yes, maybe no. It is absolutely not a guaranteed thing. Now, let me explain why, though, because you might say, well, doesn't the Gemara say it's a guaranteed thing? So there are a few things. Reason number one is that in a most literal sense, this promise only applies to miser, not miser of income. The context of the Pasuk is the miser you give from your grain to the ani, which is miser ani. It does not literally cover tzedaka in general, nor does it even cover the miser of 10% of my income. It might be limited to the miser ani that you give on year three and year six of the Shemitah cycle. So if anyone would have a claim, it might be the farmer that has such a claim, but it wouldn't be most of us. That's one answer. Now, that's a machlokas rishayinim. Some rishayinim say meiser is lav dafka, and it does apply to tzedakah, or the meiser of income, which is for aniyam, for tzedakah. But we have a number of other answers. Uh, answer number two uh, is that there is no time limit that's expressed here, meaning to say there may be a guarantee that eventually you'll have wealth, but that doesn't mean this year, and it doesn't mean immediate, and it doesn't mean you'll be able to buy the dira in Yerushalayim that you want, because it may be before you die, you'll have ashiris on one level or the other, but there's no particular time limit that's there. That's answer number two. Now answer number three, Rav Chaim Kinevsky said, it is true that tzedakah is a positive force that propels you towards the blessing of Ashiris. But we also know there are other Averos that Chazal say cause poverty. So in a sense, if you have the positive valence that is pushing you towards wealth, you also have a negative valence that is pushing you towards poverty. There are many Averis that Chazal actually say are Gorim Aniyas. So as a result, you have a push-pull going in, op or a pull-pull going in opposite directions. And as a result, 
you will be better off than you would be without the tzedakah, but you won't necessarily have ashiras because the ashiras that tzedakah would have given you might be minimized or canceled out, although not totally canceled, but at least minimized by the anias that is pulling the other way. Now, that's a very logical preposition. The only thing is, I, I honestly don't understand there uh, in what way can the Gemara describe this as being allowed to test God. I mean, it, essentially, it's a non-falsifiable proposition. You know, one of the basic rules of science is that any hypothesis that cannot be proved to be false can, by definition, never be established because no matter what happens, you have a way out. I mean, here you're telling me, if I get rich, that shows the promise is valid. If I get poor, well, it doesn't show it's invalid because maybe it just means I have some Avera that canceled it out. So if that's the case, it's never a test because no matter what happens, you know, the, the, the test is supposedly valid. So I don't know, to me, it's, a, it's a difficult to call that a, a test of HaKadosh Baruch But nevertheless, the Mephorshim do say that whatever Kayach of Ashiras Sadaka gives you can be minimized by the many Averas that are Goreim Anios. And therefore, there's no uh, guarantee you'll get rich, but you will always be better off because of Tztaka than you would be without the Tztaka. Because the Tztaka will bring something to you, and even if it gets pulled in the other direction, you'll still be ahead uh, in the sense that you would be worse off without the Tztaka. Now, there's a final answer that's actually very interesting. And that is, what is the definition of wealth? You tell me Tztaka will give me wealth. Well, what is wealth? Is wealth uh, Elon Musk or is uh, wealth uh, Bill Gates? Is that wealth? Keep in mind a very, very simple point. Uh, the average middle class person in the world today, whether it's Eritasol or America, is much better than even people who were very, very wealthy 200 years ago. Meaning, whether you like it or not, whether you see it or not, all of us are wealthy people. We are already wealthy. Tzedakah doesn't mean you're going to be Bill Gates. doesn't mean you're going to be this guy. It means you'll have Ashiras. The average person qualifies as an usher, strangely enough. You have all the food that you want. You have uh, a place to live, you know, etc. So, Memela, the Haftacha is Makoyim, that the person who gives Tzedakah will live a life of Ashiras, by comparison to the vast majority of people who lived in the world before him. Right? So there are a lot of different reasons. Therefore, it's, it's really, it's almost a disservice. I sometimes am even reluctant to say over the Gemara to people. And I don't. Usually what happens is people ask me about it, so I have to respond. But it's a real disservice for people to think, I'm going to get rich and give stucca. And then they become apicorsin because they say, oh, I gave stucca for a whole year. You know, and I still couldn't afford uh, my house mortgage payment. And you know that, you know, t t to look at it in such a transactional way, I gave stucca, therefore, I'm going to be rich, is a tice on a lot of levels. Uh, as I say, number one, you are considered to be rich. Uh, number two, you, whatever ashivas you get from stucca could be canceled out by the averus of Aeneas. Uh, number three, maybe it only applies to Meiser Dogon and it doesn't apply to uh, Tzedakah or Meiser, uh, Meiser generally, right? So there's a lot of different things. Also, it's brought down, I think Rav Chaim Kinevsky says, and this would depend on the circumstances, that the bracha Hashem gives you to your money is only if your money was earned in a 100% honest way. If there was any connection at all to dishonesty or gazela or misrepresentation or deception, then there will be no bracha on that money. So therefore the bracha of Ashiris cannot be chal on any money that was gained in an improper way, which would, all, which, which would also include chil Shabbos and the like. So the, if a person is a machal Shabbos, works on Shabbos, but happens to give tzedakah, it's still a mitzvah, but he's not necessarily going to be blessed with any type of Ashiris. So there's kama of a kama of a kama terutzim. Now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't give tzedakah. Tzedakah is a great tzachus in Olam Haba, if, if no, nowhere else. But one shouldn't simplistically think, I'm going to get rich 
by giving staka or by giving my share. Yeah. So the content of what Hashem is like allowing you, is that just to say that in this case, whatever it is I'm giving you, you're allowed to deal with it transactionally in this one case as opposed to normally where you should always be doing the mitzvah for its own sake and not for any other thing that you might think you're going to get or that I might offer? Well, well uh, I guess that's the question. I, I, don't, I don't have such a great answer to this, meaning to say, what does it mean you're testing God if indeed God cannot fail the test? <laughs> meaning to say, uh, if whatever happens, we can have an answer for then that's not a meaningful test. That, 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 that doesn't show me. Meaning I'd have to have a controlled experiment, and I don't even know how you can have a controlled experiment, in which I have to be able to reconstruct where I would be without the tzedaka, and where I am with the tzedaka, and in theory, I should always come out ahead, even if I'm not an usher. I mean, that, that's the basic uh, approach. But the only problem is, uh, that's not testable, because I can never reconstruct Maybe the AI thing could do it. I don't know. I could never reconstruct where I would be had I not given stucco. You see what I'm saying? I mean, how, how do I reconstruct my life? I can't reconstruct all of those alternatives. So the point basically is, and I think from the t Kabbalah and the Torah Devar, you see this as well, the spiritual world is an infinitely complex place. Uh, there is the interaction of so many different forces. There are the positive forces that give you zechus. There are the negative forces that give you punishments. And their intention and their pulling against each other in opposite directions. And therefore, any given person on any given day could be subject to any given result. And therefore, you can't really pinpoint things that specifically. Uh, so that's kind of the problem. And it's important, important that you know that hashkafically because otherwise, chas v'shalom, chas v'shalom, a person can lose faith if they take the statement as too literal and it doesn't happen in that way, they lose faith. In fact, just to me, it just reminds me of a story involving Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky. Uh, there was a, Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky used to be, before he was in Torah Vidas, he was a Rav in Toronto. So there are some very old, it was a long time ago, some very, very old people in Toronto who still knew Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky as a Rav in the uh, 30s and 40s, you know, uh, and the like. So uh, there was a store owner, a Jewish store owner, who kept his store open on Shabbos. He was a Mechal Shabbos before Hesia. And uh, the community was thinking about ways, he was a nice guy, and he even came to Shul. By the way, the origin of, <laughs> you know, early Shabbos Minyanim, right? A lot of Shuls have what are called Hashkama Minyanim. I say the regular Minyan is 8.30, and they have an early minion, 7 o'clock. So rabbis don't like the early minion because the rabbi gives his drasha at the late minion usually, and the whole early minion is to avoid hearing a drasha. So rabbanim generally don't like the early minion so much. Uh, and yet, uh, very often, the people who go to the early minion, I'm now venting a little bit, happen to be the B'nai Torah, who want to learn after davening, they don't want to hear the rabbi's drasha, what's, you know, none, not important to them. So, uh, so I'd like to remind them that the historical origin of early Shabbos minyanim were people who had to go to work on Shabbos. And therefore, they had to finish davening by 8.30 so they could open their store at 9 o'clock. So the Hashkama minyan was not the minyan of the tzaddikim. Well, I don't want to, I mean, I don't want to call them not tzaddikim, but the Hashkama minyan were people who, were, who felt they were not able to keep Shabbos because of the economic situation and the like. So the whole origin of the Hashkamim in Yerubadavka, the less religious people. Now again, I, I don't mean to condemn anybody, because Lamaisa it truly, truly, truly was a great sacrifice to keep Shabbos in the 20s and 30s in the United States. There were no protections for Shomer Shabbos uh, people at all. And uh, sometimes if people were employed and they didn't come to work on Saturday, they had to find a new job on Monday. They were literally, literally fired. So it took a lot of Mesiris Nefesh. So with Baruch Hashem, it is much easier today to be a Shomer Shabbos than it was in the olden days. Uh, we Bedafka should not look down at people who couldn't do it because, as Perke Yavo says, Al Tadin Es Chavercha Ad Shetagi Elim 
do not judge people till you're in their situation. We don't really know what we would have done had we been in that situation. But be it as it may, the story about Rav Yaakov was this. They wanted to convince the storekeeper, uh, store owner, not to open his store in Shabbos. And he was like religious in terms of sensibility. So they told him, you know, Moshiach can come any minute. And when Moshiach comes, how ashamed are you going to be that you're not keeping Shabbos? Moshiach can come next week. Mashiach can come on Monday. And you're going to be a Machal Shabbos the two days before that? So the person got so scared that Mashiach was coming that he immediately closed his store, became a Shomer Shabbos because he was tittering, he was trembling. Mashiach is coming. When Rav Yaakov, so, they were, so, so the people who did this were very proud of what they did. They, they were Makar of somebody. So they went to Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky and they said, look, look, look. We told the guy about Mashiach, and he immediately closed the store. Rav Yaakov was very upset. He says, you go back to the man and tell him, we don't know when Mashiach is coming. We hope we're not sure. Mashiach might come many years from now, but you should still keep Shabbos. And Rav Yaakov said, what's the idea? Because you make these promises. Mashiach is coming next week. And then what happens is Mashiach doesn't come next week. The guy becomes not Bikaris, he becomes a Kofar. He says, you guys just tell lies. You just tell stories. Rav Yaakov said, never, ever make any representation that you don't know for sure is 100% true because you turn a person off. Right? You lie to a person. Even if you think in the short term you're accomplishing something good, the long-term damage is much worse. And Rav Yaakov said, even if that means he's not going to keep Shabbos, at least he'll be a Maimon in in HaKadosh Baruch I mean, he'll believe in God, as he believes in God now. But if you tell him Mashiach is coming and Mashiach doesn't come, he may conclude the whole thing is Sheker V'chazav. So it's a very powerful idea. And indeed, in Kirov, this is an occupational hazard sometimes. Because uh, we want to make somebody religious, make somebody Shomer Mitzvahs. So we make certain claims, you know, you become from, you'll have a beautiful marriage and all of your kids will just be great. Baruch Hashem, it can happen, but it doesn't always happen, right? So you don't make guarantees like that because life can throw you for a loop, and we call that hashkachas pratis, can throw you for a loop in different ways. So you got to be realistic. Don't oversell the product to use salesman language. So by the same token, this thing about you give stucca, you become rich, I, I think has been an oversold product. And, uh, you know, the guys here take it very seriously. And, of course, anything Chazal say, we have to take very seriously. Of course, that's the case. But you have to understand it in overall context. And it doesn't mean as literal as people think it means, because there are other factors that I mentioned that you have to keep in mind. In fact, I should add another answer. Some say, some say, Ashiras is Sameach Bechelke. Psychological Ashiris. What does Pirkei Avos say? Ezeo Ashir. Who is a wealthy person? He who is happy with his lot. So maybe the Torah promises this. If you give tzedakah conscientiously, God will bless you with inner contentment. Doesn't mean you'll have more money in your bank. And these are all pshatim. It doesn't mean you'll have more money in your bank account but you'll be sameach in what you have. And that too is ashiras. Right? It reminds me a little bit, me Indian, the Indian, totally different subject, about Sandekais. Right? We know that uh, the greatest honor at a bris is the one that holds the baby when the moel does the bris. Right? So the one that holds the baby is called Sandik. Sandik, right? So Sandekais is a big honor. That's why, uh, you know, Rebel Yasha, Rebbe Chaim Kineski, people, if you could honor a gadol, and, you know, there's all sorts of issues there. Sometimes that conflicts with family. Should, should it be my grandfather or should it be a Rosh Hashiva, right? The different issues that have to be worked out. But the Ramah brings a fascinating minak, and he says, it is best not to give the same person the honor of Sandik more than once. Why? Because we find in the Beis HaMikdash, when they brought Ketores, incense, every day, twice a day, 
morning and afternoon, and Kohanim would have a lottery as to which Kohanim would do it. Uh, the only people who participated in the lottery were the Kohanim who hadn't done it before. Meaning when it came to the Shechitas HaTamid, or the sprinkling of, blood of, sprinkling of the blood of the Talmud, all Kohanim who were there could participate in the lottery. But for Ketores, only Chadoshim. Now why is that so? Because it is brought down in the Gemara that bringing incense was a segula for wealth. And we want to spread the wealth. We want everybody to have a chance, so we only have new Kohanim. Now that's the Gemara. Says the Ramah, Sandekais is a skula for Ashiras. So the same way the Keteres should be given to a new person every time, Sandekais should be given to a new person every time so you could spread the Ashiras. Now even like the Ramah, there are a gazillion exceptions. Some say for family members or your Rebbe, you know, you could duplicate it. Okay. Uh, there are exceptions to this. But the Ramah does say Sandakais is a school of Farashiris. The Vilna Gaon writes somewhat caustically, we have seen many Sandakos, Sandakim, and they have not been wealthy, and the, and the Vilna Gaon just denies the whole thing. Because unlike Stucca, there is no Gomorrah that says a Sandak gets wealthy. I mean, it's only a Messiah that people had. So the Vilna Gaon said it was a Baba Misa, he didn't, didn't believe it. But the Ramah is brought down in the Shulchan Aruch, right? So such a thing is there. So Rav Chaim Kenevsky asked his own father. Rav Chaim Kenevsky's father was a great a God all himself, the stipler, the Kihilos Yaakov, who has swarm in all of Shas. And, and the stipler was a Sandik many, many times. Because it's interesting. In a way, the Ramah's dimyon to Keteris is Bichlal, not a great dimyon, because the Ramah just says... The Ramah doesn't say you should only be a Sandik once. The Ramah says a family should, o should honor a different person every time. But if Sandik is honored by family one, he could, he could still be a Sandik for family two, family three, family four, family 10,000. So Bichlal, it's different than Kateris, where we want a new coin every time. Okay, but putting that aside, the Stipler was a Sandik many, many times. And the Stipler lived Ba'anias. So Rav Chaim Kinefsi asked his father, is this a raya to the Vilna Gaon? Because, you know, you've been a Sandik and you were not Zechah to Ashiras. And I should add, Rav Chaim Kinefsi also was a Sandik probably more times than his father and also wasn't Zechah to Ashiras. But he said that the stipler told him, his father told him, that the meaning of Ashiras is that Hashem will give you what is most important to you in your life. And he said... The thing that was most important to me was that my svarim would be written and would be spread, that people would learn my svarim. And indeed, uh, as if you, you, you may know in, in yeshiva here, that the stipler svarim, the Kehilos Yaakov, is one of the most widely studied svarim in the yeshiva world of a relatively modern achron. Like everybody learns the, uh, the Kehilos Yaakov. If you don't learn it directly, uh, you learn it indirectly because your Rebbe might get his shear uh, from the Kehilos Yaakov and, uh, and, and the like. So you see, Ashiras has different meanings. There's Samech Bechelkai, there's the Stipler's definition of Hashem will give you what you really are machshev in life. All right, so the point I'm making is, going back to the Rav Yaakov story about Mashiach, you know, don't make promises in an overly literal way that may not come true, because God forbid, that could involve the shattering of people's amuna, which is the greatest catastrophe. So I just wanted to give you a few different approaches why this is not meant to be uh, absolutely literal uh, in, that, in that way. Okay. So anyway, uh, yeah. Say again, didn't hear you. Does Hashem hold back your parasa? Uh, well, that, that might be. Again, I'm trying to think. I'm not sure if it's expressed in that way, meaning it's expressed that staka is a source of bracha. Now, what is the implication? Uh, is the absence of staka the absence of bracha, or will there actually be 
a withholding of parnasa. I, I'm not sure. I, I think it could work that way as well. Um, in fact, it's interesting. Let me remind you, I've mentioned this a few times, of the famous Ha'ora. I used to say it over in the name of the Ran, but that's a mistake. It, it is a Rabbeinu Nisam, but it's Rabbeinu Nisam Gon. It's one of the Gaonim. It's not the Rabbeinu Nisam, the Ran, who is a Rishon. And Rabbeinu Nisam says the following. We read in the Torah that Sodom and Amira were destroyed. They were evil people, and they were destroyed. Now, it doesn't say Beferish why in the Chumash. It just describes them as Ra'im v'chatoim. And it doesn't say what their evil was. So some connect it to Mishkav Zachar. That's where the word sodomy comes from. But that's not in the narrative of the Chumash itself. I mean, indirectly, the Chumash is Marames to it, that there was something going on when, uh, when the people of Sodom surrounded Lot's house and said, bring out your guests so we may know them. Okay, there, there, there is a legitimate in, intimation of what later was called sodomy because of this. But if you look in the Navi Yechesko, it's very, very clear that the essence of the sin of Sodom was cruelty and lack of compassion to the poor. That is what the Navi Yechesko says. The Navi Yechesko says they were cruel, they were unfeeling, people were suffering, people were poor, they didn't care. And indeed, uh, all the Midrashim, the Midrashim on Sodom in the Parsha, focus on that. They talk about all the selfishness and lack of rachamim. In fact, you can even have analogies to uh, the immigration crisis uh, in the United States. It says, Sodom had more or less a border fence. Sodom was very anti-immigration because Sodom was very prosperous, very fertile. And as a result, a lot of poor people migrated to Sodom to kind of live off the welfare state. And the Sodomites didn't want to have their wealth diluted with a lot of people coming. So they had some very severe anti-immigration laws. Like, okay, you might, you might want to apply it to a contemporary situation. So it's very, very clear under the Navi Yechesko, and Chazal take this on in the Midrashim, that Sodom was destroyed because of Ben Adam L'chavero, because of the cruelty and lack of rachamim. So Frecht Rabbeinu Nisim Gain, the people of Sadaim are Goyim. They're not Jewish. They're not bound by the 613 mitzvahs, which in any case we're not given yet. They're only bound by the seven commandments of Noah. Now, I look at the seven commandments of Noah, I don't see any commandment to give tzedakah. So if a ben Noah doesn't give tzedakah, if a ben Noah doesn't help a person in trouble, which of the seven commandments of Noah are they transgressing? They're not transgressing any of them. So how could they be punished if they haven't violated any of the laws that they were given? Which means a Jew, to answer your question, a Jew could be punished because tzedakah is a mitzvah. I don't do a mitzvah, I could be punished for that. But if a guy doesn't give tzedakah, what are you punishing him for? So Rabbeinu Nisam Gain says an amazing thought, the incorporation of natural law. He says a human being should know certain things even without God commanding it explicitly. A normal human being knows that when people are suffering, I'm supposed to help them. And Hashem will hold us accountable for the stuff we should have figured out on our own, even in the absence of a commandment. That's pretty amazing. Uh, this is what philosophers call a natural law ethic, meaning there are certain principles of life that even without divine revelation, we should be aware of. An amazing thing. And Hashem will hold us accountable. So it's not enough to say, I looked at the whole Shulchan Aruch, and there's nothing in the Shulchan Aruch that I violated. Well, as the Chazanish used to put it, there's a fifth chilek of Shulchan Aruch. I mean, the fifth could be described different ways, common sense, common decency, whatever it would be. But there is a fifth chilek of the Shulchan Aruch, which Hashem expects us to master, right? Mastering the first four are hard enough. Indeed, that's very hard. But there's a fifth one that you have to know as well. And Hashem will ask us, why didn't you keep the fifth 
chilek of Shulchan Aruch. So this is quite amazing. This is essentially the incorporation of natural law into revealed law, which is very interesting because we normally understand that God's will comes to us through revelation. That's the Yisod of Matan Torah. Hashem communicated his will. Right? That'll be called revelatory law, law that comes through divine revelations. Moshe Rabbeinu, Matan Torah. But you also see there's, there's an additional augmentation of law or ideas that I should understand from the nature of my godly soul, that from within my neshama, certain ideas should spring forth and Hashem will hold me accountable for not heeding my, what I call it, conscience, intuition, whatever lashon you would, you would use to describe that process. And indeed, well, I don't want to get into this topic because it is complicated because then you get into issues where the intuition contradicts the revelation, like killing a Amalek, things like that, then you have this conflict where the Torah seems to be telling you to do something that is against the basic decency. Obviously, practically, the revelation trumps everything else because your intuitions could be off in a million different ways. So God tells you, this is the law, this is the law. But again, spiritually, it can sometimes be a, a conflict. Um, but in the case of the Sodomites, there was no conflict because there was no revelation. Don't give Stucca. Hashem didn't say anything. They should have figured out the imperative of, of compassion. So this is really a very, very, very uh, amazing insight of Rabbi Nisim Gaon. Again, I, I, I've, uh, I remembered it was Rabbi Nisim, so I, so I said over in Dresha Sarad, but it's not in the Dresha Sarad. Rabbi Nisim Gaon, in fact, I can tell you where, exactly where it is, uh, if you ever want to look at it. Um, Rav Nisim Gaon, if you look at Maseches Brachos, so there actually is what you might call introduction to the Talmud, which is around two pages, you know, a, a blot. And this is the Hakdama of Rabbi Nisim Gaon. In fact, in Brachos, he has on the side, he has like commentaries every few pages. It's a very fragmentary commentary. It's not complete, although it's very interesting on some Agada and the like. And apparently it was part of a lost commentary on the whole Talmud. But he wrote an introduction to the Talmud, and in that introduction he brings out this idea. So right before Daf Beis of Brachos, you will see, uh, you will see the Hakdamer of Nisim Gaon. Rabbi Chaim Kineski used to learn that. He considered that when he would uh, you know, start Shas. He, he learned Shas with some regularity. <laughs> uh, he would always do uh, the Hakdama of Rav Nisim Gaon was his Daf Aleph, right? Pro, uh, the Masecha starts in Daf Beis. Uh, Rav Nisim Gaon's Hakdama is Daf Aleph. So he always considered Daf Aleph as part of his uh, Seder in learning uh, Shas. Okay. Um, all right, maybe we'll, we'll stop here. Again, I apologize for being late. There, there was traffic. I couldn't get back in time. Okay, so Mr. Shem, we'll go back to the Tamar Devorah tomorrow. Thank you for listening to this awesome Eich production. To find out more and to partner in our mission, please visit ohr.edu.